What did the Apostle Paul preach to the lost? Okay. For many years now, there has been a lot of debate back and forth, back and forth, over what the word repent means, what does it mean to get saved, what is the true gospel, whatever else. And people can go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, or verses in Romans, or this verse or that verse to try and define what the gospel is. And they can come out with totally different interpretations and compare to this and compare to that. But the best way to really prove what Paul was preaching is actually look at accounts where he was preaching the gospel to the lost. Acts chapter 24. In other words, Paul wrote certain things about what the gospel is to define the gospel, but what was it that he was putting into practice? Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 24 and going down to verse 25. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Okay? Paul's preaching the gospel here to Felix and his wife Drusilla, as well as all the other people that are gathered there. Has that opportunity from the Lord to preach the gospel. What's he preached to him? And as he reasoned of righteousness, there's three things here, righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. And answered, Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Um, why didn't Paul just say, Hey, uh, Felix, um, we're all sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We've all sinned. Okay. Uh, you know, Jesus died on the cross to pay for sinners. Since we're all sinners, all you got to do is just believe. Just, just by faith, you just believe that, that Jesus died and, and believe it. And you're a Christian. Simple. See, that's what hyper-dispensationalists will teach. Okay, big difference between a dispensationalist, dispensational preacher, and a hyper-dispensational preacher. A dispensational preacher like myself says, well, from you know the book of Acts, basically, there's some transition stuff that happens there, but the whole way up through until you get to the book of Hebrews. And then it's switching to the time of Jacob's trouble. A hyper-dispensationalist says, oh, actually, no, there's a different body there that's preaching repentance and they're going to the Jews. And then Paul, he brings in the real gospel and nobody's really saved or in Christ until Paul, which can easily be refuted. And there's actually parts of the Pauline epistles where Paul is preaching to Jews and not to Christians. And therefore we'll just kind of, and they, they cut up all kinds of things. Okay. That's not the stand of a Bible believing preacher. That's a hyper dispensational stand. And they will get, get into the whole thing of trying to remove repentance They'll change the wording of repentance. What is repentance? I'm going to show you what it is here in this study. And they'll pervert the gospel, terribly pervert the gospel. But look what Paul preached, something that no hyper-dispensational preacher, these easy believism people, uh, free grace, whatever you want to call them, they will never preach this for one second. Look what Paul preached. Righteousness. They'll say, why would you preach about somebody having to repent of sin why would you have to preach that to a lost person that can't possibly repent of sin? Okay, why would you preach righteousness to lost people? Why on earth would Paul ever even bring up righteousness and temperance? Why would he bring that up to somebody that's lost? If there's no changed life that comes after salvation. That's a problem, isn't it? Uh, no, Paul preached righteousness to lost people because there is a different life that you live as a Christian. You don't just have a profession of faith and live just like the lost world. That's not true salvation. Paul preached righteousness. What's the second thing that he preached? Temperance. Don't eat too much. Don't drink too little. Don't make too much money. Uh, hi, Felix and Drusilla. Uh, don't make too little money. You see? Temperance. Don't drink too much alcohol. Don't drink too little. Don't have a house that's too big. Don't have a house that's too little. Temperance. It's also called moderation in the scriptures. Very similar thing there. Why on earth would Paul preach that to a king, to a royal man, a member of royalty? Talks about another place where they come in, there's great pomp and everything else, and they got all their royal apparel on and everything else. And here's this Paul down here. And he's there and he's saying, let me talk to you a little bit about temperance. To royalty? 
with their big lavish parties and their big, the best of everything and the, the best clothing and the, the biggest mansions and castles and whatever else. And Paul's going to preach temperance to somebody like that. Paul, just preach, for, just belief, just believe. All you got to do is believe. No, Paul preached righteousness. He pe preached temperance. And what's the third thing? Judgment to come. Coming judgment. Why would he preach that to him? Because that's the greatest motivating factor for you to get saved. You will be judged for your sins. Hey, Paul's saying, I'm down here, I'm a prisoner. Probably smelled bad and whatever else, and you're up there, there, Felix and Drusilla. Hello. I'm out of the judgment. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. You're going to hell. You say, well, he wouldn't have preached that. Then why does it say Felix trembled? He trembled at the words of Paul. Let me get real uh, confrontational. Do people tremble when you witness to them? Do you upset people so bad that they're shaking the lost? Hmm. If that's not happening, then you're not preaching what Paul preached. I'm not saying you've got to be screaming at him and screaming, you're going to hell or something. You don't need to be doing that. Just preach. You can preach in the calmest tone possible and explain to them the reality of hell. Explain to them the reality of their sinful, self-righteous pride and where it's going to take them. And watch them tremble. And preach to them about righteousness and temperance. They'll tremble. I've seen it. They'll either tremble out of fright or they'll tremble out of anger. I've seen it many times. So I, I, I'm, I'm not really into that. I don't think we should be preaching that way. Okay, then you're not preaching anything that Paul preached. Just as simple as that. But look at Felix's response. Classic. Go thy way and answered. Go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season I will call for thee. Get a little convicted there, Felix. Trembling a little bit, aren't you there, Felix? Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Well, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I can't right now, Paul. You know, I, I, maybe some other time I'd like to hear you. You know, uh, yeah, I heard a good gospel presentation there from this Husky 394 XP channel. My name's Brian Dunlinger. I heard, I heard some things there, and I got kind of convicted. You know what? I think I'm just going to put this video in my favorites folder, and uh, maybe I'll come back and watch it some other time. I'll just kind of like it, or I'll, I'll just kind of, um, you know, I'll come back and I'll think about this again sometime. Uh, you better think about it right now. Your eternity is the most important thing. You say, well, I just, uh, I got to get up and get something to eat. Eternity is more important. Well, maybe I, I ought to sleep on this and think about it a little bit. If you're under conviction that you need to get saved, you got to get it taken care of. Nothing's more important. You say, well, I got to get to work. Call in sick. <laughs> okay. You're sick of this life. You're sick of this world. All right. Get saved. Well, maybe when I have a convenient season. Okay, Felix. Let's go to the next place. Acts chapter 26. You say, okay, that's just one place. Well, let's keep going. Acts chapter 26, verse 14, down through verse 20. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And ri but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Turning from darkness to light, that almost sounds like repenting of sins, doesn't it? Hmm. And from the power of Satan unto God. Huh. Interesting. And that they may receive forgiveness of sins. But I thought we weren't supposed to preach on sins. Just a general truth that all have sinned and no personal conviction or anything else. 
No, you're supposed to preach forgiveness of sins. God will forgive you of your sins. And He'll help you to turn from that life that you once lived. He'll make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Give you a fresh start. It's called being born again. It's not a sinless, perfect life that you get and you somehow never mess up again. That isn't true, all right? But it's a major change that happens. An inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, and look at who Paul's talking to here, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should... Believe in Jesus and go to heaven when they die. Thank you. Come again. Yeah, that's not what he says. That they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. You know, years and years ago, there was a very wicked, vile man out there called himself a preacher. He wasn't anything of the kind. He was a con artist. His name was Jack Hiles, uh, First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana. He's dead and in hell now. Praise the Lord for that. And this man came out and he said, repentance doesn't have anything to do with sin. It just means simply turning from unbelief to belief. You see, Jack Hiles was about numbers. Jack Hiles was about getting his church building, his corporation, to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Huge. We want the biggest church ministry, bus ministry. We want the biggest Sunday school. We are the biggest Baptist church. We're the greatest. We're the... That's what he was about. You aren't going to get many people saved. That's the reality of this world. Not many people get saved at any time in history, okay? Especially in the 20th century when Jack Hiles was supposedly having these great, huge, big movements and everything else. He was a lying con, con artist. I've talked to many people that went there over the years that were there when Jack Hiles was alive. It was a big con artist game. And he came up with this satanic doctrine of repentance being turning from unbelief to belief. Okay, let's go with that for a minute. Let's read the text that they should we'll replace repent with turn from unbelief to belief, that they should turn from unbelief to belief and turn to God. Uh, that's a lot of turning. All right? <laughs> that's not what it means. Repent does not mean turning from unbelief to belief. Anybody that says that, you can, be rest, you can rest assured they're not getting it from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not telling them to say that. Repentance means you are saying it's an end to your self-righteousness. I can't save myself. There's no possible way. I'm not a good person. It's a change of mind. It's a change of direction. You can, you can come up with all these little things. It doesn't matter. The whole point is, it's, a, it's, a, it's something major that changes in your life where you stop saying, I, I can't trust in myself. I, I, I'm not going to trust in myself anymore. You start to say that. Not stop saying, you start to say that. All right? That's what repentance means. You are repenting. You are stopping the self-righteousness saying, I'm a good person, and you're turning to God. You don't turn to the mirror and say, you're a good person. You're not like Hitler, you know. Uh, you're, I've, never, I've never killed anybody. I've never robbed a bank. I'm not so bad. You look in the mirror and you say, you're vile. You're rotten. Every time I try to do my best, I mess up. I fail. I don't know why I'm living. And you hear about Jesus Christ dying for you. And you look at that mirror and you say, all you're ever doing is leading me astray. I'm going to turn to God. I don't want myself. I don't want my little good deeds and little whatever else. I've messed up my life bad. I need God's help. That's what Paul's writing about there. And what happens as a result of that? When somebody's born again. And do works meet for repentance. Works will follow true conversion. All of a sudden, your standards of dressing will change. All of a sudden, your standards of what you listen to, music-wise, what you watch with your eyes, what comes out of your mouth, everything starts to change. It's not an instant boom and you're just holy, righteous, sanctified, saint of, you know. Oh no, it's going to take you years sometimes. There's still things the Lord convicts me about. I've been saved now for quite a few years. There's still things, almost 20 years, there's still things the Lord will convict me about. Say, hey, you need to get that out of your life. The Lord will be gentle as a father would to his child and he'll lovingly correct you. And he'll say, stop doing that, son. Oh, you didn't listen. Well, there's a little swat. <laughs> it's called chastening. All right? 
but there will be works meet for repentance. You say, there doesn't have to be. Well, if you're lost, that's true. If you're saved, yes, there does have to be works meet for repentance. And if there is no works meet for repentance, you didn't get saved. Just as simple as that. You say, how do you define the works meet for repentance? What's that all about? Go to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eight through eleven. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Let me stop there for just a minute. The religious system that you are in, does it give you confidence to know that you're going to go to heaven when you die? Or do you say, Well, I don't think anybody can know for sure. You're in the wrong system. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. You are supposed to know where you're going when you die. You are supposed to be confident of that fact. Now see, if you're trusting in your own self-righteousness, you never can really know. Because you'll do some good deeds and you'll think, I think I'm going to make it. I think I'm going to get to heaven when I die. And all of a sudden you do something rotten and you go, Uh-oh, um... Maybe I just tipped the scales the wrong way and I'm kind of, maybe I'm going to hell now. Uh, I better do some good stuff and help out my karma. You know, you see, when you trust in yourself, then you can't know that you're going to go to heaven when you die. When you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can know. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Look at the second part of that. Absent from the body. I'm willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. A truly saved Christian is not going to feel 100% comfortable on this earth. You're going to think to yourself, boy, I sure wish the Lord would come. You'll have good days. You'll have beautiful sunny days with flowers and pretty birds singing in the trees and whatever else. And you'll really enjoy life and have a great day. And other days you'll just feel rotten and just say, Lord, can you please take me home now? That's what happens, you see. Again, lost people don't get that. Lost people, it's all about this world and all about the fun and I'm just enjoying life and life is good. Uh-huh. Because you're self-righteous. You don't want to hear about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Do you? If you're lost. Verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. We are confident, I say, in, uh, excuse me, verse 9. I'm up to verse 7. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Are you lab laboring for the Lord? You want to be accepted of Him, don't you? Do you want to get up there to heaven and have the Lord be ashamed of you? Hmm. Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Everybody gets judged. Every single man and woman and child. Well, I shouldn't say child if they're under the age of accountability, but every single man and woman, you're going to be all judged. Everybody gets judged. The lost get judged and sent to hell for all of eternity. The saved get judged. Their works get judged. You say, well, that's not a judgment for the people. Well, not in the sense of if you do bad you know, as a Christian, you're going to go to hell or lose your salvation. That's not going to happen. But what you will lose is you will lose anything you've ever done in your life. You're going to look and you're going to see your work's just burned up. Everything's just gone. I mean, wouldn't it be a great thing to stand before God someday and have the Lord look down at you and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, that's kind of a thing you want to kind of work towards. You say, well, then that's our motivation. No. Your motivation is found in verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. You know, when you realize what God is and what He has planned for the lost into eternity, all of a sudden you realize there's some terror there. People are going to die. They're going to go to hell. And it's our job to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ and to warn them in whatever way you can. If you're kind of an outgoing person and things, we'll go up and talk to people. Just witness to people and things. Ask them where they, if they know where they're going to go when they die and whatever else. Um, 
if you're not real outgoing like that, well, then get some gospel tracks. Go lay in places. Go, you know, uh, see a case of beer at the grocery store and go p slip a gospel track down in there. So, you know, so when happy hour comes later on, maybe it will be truly a happy hour and they'll get saved. You see? But if you're not preaching righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, then you're not preaching what Paul preached. If the lost world can hear your gospel presentation and come away without trembling, you're not preaching anything that Paul preached. You better think about that. And if there's some kind of a gospel out there that's telling you there is no repenting, there's no changed life that comes after salvation, there's no holiness or righteousness or whatever, that's dangerous. It's very dangerous. I'm not saying to go full on Catholic work salvation and you're just working all the time to maintain your salvation or whatever else. Oh no, I'm not talking about that. That is work salvation. That's excluding Jesus Christ. That's pushing Jesus Christ out. Again, it's self-righteousness. See, easy believism is self-righteousness. What we call easy believism. You can call it free grace or hyper-dispensationalism, whatever you want to call it. It is a form of self-righteousness. Why? I'm not that bad of a person. There's no serious sins in my life that I have to get out or whatever else. And, and I just, yeah, I believe Jesus saved, saved me. Yeah, sure, he died on the cross. Yeah, I believe it. Yep, okay. I'm going to go on and do my thing without any conviction of sin. See, that's self-righteousness. It's also self-righteousness to have works for salvation. You see, because you're still looking to yourself. You are maintaining your own salvation. You're constantly thinking, I better not do X, Y, and Z because I could lose my salvation. It's one of my favorite things to say to people. They say, do you believe that you can lose your salvation? I say, absolutely not, because it's not my salvation. It's the salvation of Jesus Christ. His righteousness is imputed to me. He paid for my sins. So that is going to be it for this video. Um, make sure that you're preaching the right gospel. Make sure that you are, and more importantly, make sure that you are believing the right gospel. When you see some people tremble, when you present the gospel to them, you'll see one of two things. Number one, they will tremble because they're afraid of what you're saying. Or number two, they'll tremble, and this is the more likely of the two, they'll tremble because they're so angry. They'll be just shaking. You know, don't you cram your beliefs down my throat. You have that right to tell me I'm going to hell. How would you do You see that? Then you're preaching the right gospel. Okay? If your gospel presentation is so sissy and so lukewarm and watered down that it doesn't upset anybody, check to make sure that you're even saved. So that is going to be it. I pray you take heed to these things and uh, obey the scriptures and not what some false teachers tell you on YouTube. Okay? That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.